Welcome to another episode, Dr. James Beckett, Sports Card Insights, here with Rich Klein. We're going to talk about uh, baseball hobby news. Uh, I think we'll do this in a then and now format because it's no longer around. The founders, Frank and Vivian Barning, were personal friends of both uh, Rich and myself. And we will talk about the Barnings and baseball hobby news and how uh, important it was in uh, uh, back in the day. So, but first, again, thanks to Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication, Com C, Burbank Sports Cards, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Heritage Auctions, Huggins and Scott Auctions, Upper Deck, Panini, and Tops are wonderful sponsors. Rich, uh, you actually did you write for uh, Baseball I, Hobby News before you even wrote for uh, for the Beckett Publishers? Oh, I wrote right? for Baseball Hobby News. Considerably, right? Yeah, considerably. I was one of the dealers. Early 80s? Early 80s. I was one of the dealers that participated in the dealer comments each month. And yeah. so I always had... But they were Long Island in those days, right? They started in Long Island. They moved to San Diego in 1982. 82? 82. 82. When did they start? They started in... 79 was 79, the first. 79, yeah. And Max, the late Max Silverman, was the first subscriber, and I was in the first right. hundred, just like I was in the first hundred for Beckett. Max was proud about that. He, as he should be. Yeah. And Max was a great guy. Well, even though they were from Long Island, they they really made a real attempt to cover, because there was a lot going on in, in that part of the world. In fact, that was a very important part of the collecting world in those days, but they really made an attempt to to cover the whole industry. And they did, and a, did an excellent job. They did a really good job. They were really, they were both journalists at heart. And a husband and wife team, a real team, it right. seemed like. Because they knew what the strengths of each person was. And Frank was one of these people that understood who had talent to do what. When everybody who was writing columns in the 80s was going full full, full gear. Daryl Berger, Alan Klingenberger, Nick Edson. There were others as well. The, the people who contributed, as it, like I did, to the dealer panels, yeah. the, the occasional articles. And Frank also did one thing. Frank and Vivian did one thing that was really important in those days. They had the hobby. They had what they called who's who in the hobby. And they would do right. articles on people. Yeah. And you would fill it out, and they would, and they or somebody else would fix it, and you know make it a nice cogent article. Right. And there were some really cool stories. I got one of my favorite books of all time, which I actually got back at uh, Kyle's big show a couple weeks ago from Jerry Adamic. It was like, Jerry, I don't have any money. He goes, just just take the book and pay me what you think is fair. And I still don't know what to pay him for it. But it was, what was it? the ballparks written by Bill Shannon and with the photos by George Kalinsky, a table sized copy book. They made 11,276 copies of that book. Yeah. And I remember, and that book was like $100, $150. And I remember a gentleman by the name of Frank McLean, who was a policeman in Philadelphia, contacted me. And I drove down. I met him at Veterans Stadium in Philly. And we did, and we did the deal for me to get him the book in the parking lot of Veterans Stadium. Hmm. And so I, it was basically one day I just said, I'm leaving for about six hours. And I drove, got the book. And I was thrilled. And I, when I got married, I sold my autograph book collection. Yeah. And when I saw the book on Jerry's table, it was like, I have to have this. You know, I rarely say I have to have anything. <laughs> I had to have that book. And it was like so cool that it brought back the memories of Frank and the who's who. And, you know, on a tangible level, it, it reminded me what just filling out a who's who uh, portrait. The who's did. who was a nice touch. I, I agree. Now, they were uh, editors, publishers. Uh, you know, it was it was a tabloid. Uh, we ours were in the early days were saddle stitch, which kind of means like stapled with a with a, a external uh, sturdier cover, or and uh, perfect bound where it's kind of like glue bound where it doesn't open up as wide. But they were tabloid without any staples, and which is uh, not only a cheaper way to do it, it's also more expedient. It takes less time. Yes, and so it had a newspaper feel to it, a very newsy feel. It didn't have as many ads as Sport Collectors Digest, which was probably the leading circulation periodical of the day but they really relished the news gathering and getting the stories out there and they wanted the stories to be right they just didn't want to write the stories they wanted it to be right they weren't sensationalists no but at the same time they actually were collectors and did a little bit of dealing didn't seem to be a conflict they weren't really doing a price guide no, I mean, they, they did the dealer price. Actually, they did, they price, did a price, price guide, price but it wasn't like a Beckett price guide. It was mm. yeah, some superstars. Well, everybody was doing it back right. in those days, so they felt like they maybe had to. Yeah, and, and they actually helped their circulation, so they did have to. But the one thing was that they were way ahead of the curve. They were doing T206 Master Set before most people thought about doing all the backs and all the different things and how, how they did not. They came close. They did not finish the set before they sold it. But they So they were selling 50s cards and buying... 1910 cards. And they would sell their duplicates in the 1910s mm-hmm. cards, and they weren't doing a price guide on 1910, so that right, was fun. Right, right. And selling, you know, bringing four or five albums to a show was paying for their trip. Exactly. To help, which, yeah. 
which is a reasonable way of doing business. Years later, in just fall of '82 to San Diego, and they were there for 23 years. And they moved to Vegas in June of 2005, and we invited them to the wedding because I had known yeah. them forever. And you got married in Vegas too, right? I got married. That was the week they moved into their house. The weekend they moved into the house was our wedding weekend. So they couldn't come Richard, to the, are you coordinating these things? I mean, how, it was the weirdest thing. That's an amazing so, trivia thing. It's, it was the weirdest coincidence, and they just said, no, it's fine. You know, you got to move on with your life, and they moved to Vegas in June of 2005. Well, that's, that's terrific. Were they, did they still have any cards left at that point? I don't think so. Or I don't think so. I know Vivian for a few years liked busting packs and having fun and seeing what type of hits she would get. I think now... They don't do much with any sort of cards. I think now at this point, they're pretty much out of doing anything with cards. Well, what do they spend time doing? Well, Frank had some health issues recently, yeah. so he spent some time in a rehab home. Okay. The last post I saw said he was doing better. Okay. And, you know, and Vivian's doing whatever Vivian now does, and they have their house, and they're happily retired at this point. Which one was the better writer? I think, I don't want to say, I'm sure they were both good writers, but I think Frank wrote more. So mm -hmm. Frank was probably a slightly better writer, and I think Vivian was better organizer. What was the peak, you think, for Baseball Hobby News? I think the peak was when they were still on the East Coast, maybe 81, 82. I think a little got lost when they moved to San Diego, but it's a heck of a good life adjustment to get out of right. New York. Nothing against New York. I grew up in the New York area. I love New York. But, yeah. hey, if you're, moving, if you're moving to San Diego, you're not exactly... That's really, not bad, uh, bad duty. I think. That's not a bad duty. Unless you're a Marine. <laughs> yeah, so... Camp Pendleton. Uh, you know, back in 84 at the Precipity National, I remember having conversations leading up to that... Uh, leading up to that show with them because I, it was still not decided that I was even going to do a pro I'd already been doing annual books in multiple sports. So I had uh, that going, but I was contemplating starting a, a magazine, what later became back at baseball card monthly and uh, which actually started in late 84, but at the 84 national in Parsippany where you were, you and I met on the apocryphal uh, softball, softball field, field, which I'm not denying we met then. I'm just thinking it was we probably earlier, met earlier yes. in the, at, a, at a New York show when you were you, you and I were in the same place yeah. at the same time. But uh, remember discussing with them and, and having phone conversations before about the possibility of me doing the baseball price guide on a monthly basis within their monthly tabloid. Tabloid uh, had an appeal to me in one sense because when it's a tabloid and it's not Staddle stitched or perfect bound. It's a it's a, a a newspaper feel that is very expedient. Newspapers can get out way faster than than magazines because you don't have to bind them. You just you know print the paper and fold it up and send it out. So the timeliness of that sounded good, but I didn't quite see how that would work in terms of uh, the the revenue share. They already had a substantial following and circulation. Would I participate in the upside? Uh, what you know, would they be paying me a flat fee or with a, with an incentive? It just wasn't clear how that was going to work. But I basically, up to that point, up to the national, I'd been thinking I've got two ways I could do this. One is I could, I could get in with somebody that's already got uh, wherewithal and circulation to hit the ground running with somebody like the Barnings, and I really felt like they would have been the best choice going down that path or starting from scratch, building my own team, learning about typesetting and all the things that. It, which history showed that's what I actually picked. But up until the beginning of the National in Precipity, where, where you were there, uh, it, it was I, I was leaning toward doing it my, on my own and forming the team, and I actually did pick that. And so by the end of that National, I had announced that I was doing it. And I, again, not trying to apologize to them, but because I never, I didn't break any promises, but I really thought there was a chance I could do it with them. And I don't know that that would have been a bad thing, but looking in hindsight, it would have been not the better choice. And I have a happier story because I was actually next to them at the 84 National. You had the table right next to them. Right next to them. In fact, my dad worked for some, my dad helped their table. And the, a couple months later, a month later, when they ran a photo, it was my dad behind their table at the National. So I, so oh, I, ha I had them send me a photo. And for years, <laughs> I just kept it in my desk just so I could say hi to my dad, even though at the office, even though he wasn't there. And a friend of mine, Dr. Walt Brown, who was one of the leading Kennedy assassination experts in the country and has written books on the subject, he needed a 51 blueback Bobby Dorr to complete his tops run. And I looked pretty good at the show, pretty well at the show, you know, all four days, looking at people's tables I knew who looked like they had cards like that. The Barnings were the only table that had it that, that I could <laughs> see. I could have saved four days of looking just by going to their table right next to me. Well... Rich, knowing your ability to to uh, to quickly scan things, it may have been the only one in the room. So you maybe should have started your search uh, a little closer. But 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 that's good. And, but you know, we and I don't know if this 
is mentioned, but we, in a way, you, and I don't want to say farm club, but you were able to recruit several people, myself, Theo Chen, and Mike Payne, among others, perhaps, that wrote for Baseball Hobby News before they came to work for you down in Dallas. Well, one of the best uh, predictors of future success is past success. And when you look at the work product of those three outstanding individuals, they had collecting knowledge and the ability to get their thoughts uh, coherently on paper and were, were excellent writers as well. So Theo had a great ride with us. Mike Payne has been on the bus, off the bus, and back on the bus. He's an outstanding uh, editor as well. And you're, uh, it goes without saying that you've had uh, an illustrious career uh, since that time. But again, looking, uh, wasn't they, they, they were freelance people and we needed full-time people. And so we, we extended offers and and uh, those uh, those great guys said yes, and like I said, we had we had some uh, wonderful years together, and you and I are still experiencing that. Yes. But if that's thank you to the Barnings, then absolutely, and thank you to Baseball yeah. Hobby News. That's that's great. But and I want to say someday I sure hope to meet one of the quietest freelancers they ever had, a gentleman by the name of Rex King. Who's Rex King? That was Frank's pseudonym. Oh please! <laughs> oh gosh, Rex King. That's a play on words. Yes. I tell you. Uh, we hired Randy. Barney. Yes, we did. Bar- Randy. Uh, Randy came to work for it, us for about two it, years. It yeah. wasn't. It wasn't the right fit at the time, but he was good at what he did. He was at. He actually probably would be better today than he was then. Because he's digital savvy. Yes. Yeah. Um, he was very digitally. I believe he lives in yeah, Austin. Yeah. And had done some interesting things. You know who his high school best friend was? I uh, was Rashawn Salam. Salam. Yeah, who's now passed away. Yes. But was a I once made a mistake of thinking it was Tony Clark because Tony Clark and, nope, nope. and Frank immediately corrected me. He says, no, it was Rashad. They Salon. went to San Diego Country Day. Yeah, that's okay. a really good school. It was a good school. But, uh, but Randy was a, was, a, was a sharp young man. Yes, yeah. he was. But you, you would expect that with yes. sharp parents. But, yes. Uh, any, what, what do you think the high point was for, for baseball hobby? I think they were in their peak about 81, 82 before they moved to San Diego. Mm-hmm. But I think as a publication, they continued to be strong almost all to the to the end of their last couple of issues. In their last issues, were they? They were had they, gone to an oversized, yeah. full color. They, so you think in hindsight, maybe that was a... Well, they were trying to get newspapers, news, not newspaper sales. They were trying to get, mag, you know... Oh, to get on the newsstands. They were trying to get on the newsstands. Mm-hmm. And, Which is not all it's cracked up to be, but... Uh, they were doing okay with it, but they realized yeah. that it was time to go for it. But them. it was kind of a... Again, in this industry, you have a chance to do, which I'm... Just blessed beyond measure that I have a situation where you start out a labor of love and you actually make money on it. Did they have that same experience? They did because of the cards they did. They built a almost a master set of T206. Yeah. So when they sold it about 20 years ago, they did. So they made more money on they that. Made they made more money did. on that. And so yeah. they did very well with the cards. So I can't really say they're, they're, not, strugg- they're not struggling yeah. in any way. Well, I'm not struggling either. And I don't think you're struggling too much, but it's just a situation where when you're doing something you love and you're making money, that's a good thing. And they did it for a long time and were a key. The Barnings, it wasn't just that Baseball Hobby News was a, was a, one of the leading publications of the day and, and a, a precursor and it paved the way for other things, including uh, some of the success that Rich and I enjoyed with Beckett Publications. But uh, it's a hobby largely about relationships. So not only did we get that magazine and Rich wrote for him, I probably, I don't know that I contributed, but I, I'm sure I was a who's who or something. I'm, sh- I'm sure you, I'm but, sure you put ads in for the annual book. And, and things like that. But, you know, you, you, you're friends with the people yes. and you, you admire what they did and and I'm really happy that they're enjoying the life that they have now, which is what, what we really want for uh, for everybody. So, again, thanks, listeners. Thanks, Rich. Thanks, Barnings, for providing so much enjoyment for for, uh, for several uh, decades. And we wish you the best in uh, Las Vegas. And uh, we will be back tomorrow with another episode. So thanks again. Talk to you soon.